All right, so this lesson is part two of the lesson on cellular respiration and metabolism. We're going to continue where we left off the other day. If we look again at an overview of the process, uh, we had talked about glycolysis and the process of glycolysis um, breaking glucose apart into two pyruvate molecules, producing some ATP in substrate level phosphorylations and then generating some electrons that are carried by NADH um, along to eventually the electron transport chain, but also the pyruvate entering what's called the Krebs cycle. We're going to be focusing uh, this time on the Krebs cycle and talking some about the electron transport chain as well. We also talked about last time about some alternative pathways where the, gluco the pyruvate does not enter the Krebs cycle but um, is converted in other ways to get to extract some energy using fermentation or anaerobic processes. <clears throat> so the um, pyruvate that is, that is generated during the process of glycolysis um, in aerobic respiration is going to enter the citric acid cycle, also called the Krebs cycle. So these are the same thing, Krebs cycle and citric acid cycle. This process takes place within the mitochondria in the area called the matrix, which is the fluid-filled interior of the mitochondria. The first, in the first step, pyruvate is going to be converted into acetyl-CoA, or acetyl-coenzyme A. In this process, carbon dioxide is given off. Um, one molecule of carbon dioxide for every pyruvate. So now we've gone from three carbons to two, because we're giving off a carbon dioxide. The acetyl-coenzyme uh, A enters the citric acid cycle. There's a multi-step process that happens. Numerous intermediate molecules formed, um, some of them unstable and break apart. Um, but in all of that, those processes, you end up um, using up to ATP molecules in substrate-level phosphorylations, and four ATP molecules are generated. So you get a net of two ATP out. In the process, also three more NADH molecules are generated, along with another electron carrier molecule called FADH2, and two more carbon dioxides are released for each pyruvate. So those, that's the whole glucose molecule. We had a total of six carbon atoms from glucose. Um, we get rid of one in the first step here, and then we get rid of two more at the end of the citric acid cycle for a total of three, but this happens twice because we had two pyruvates. So that's, that's your six right there. Okay, so, so just to give you an idea of this, here's your cell. This is a, happens to be an animal cell, but this process takes place in a plant cell as well. Um, and then we have our mitochondria. That's where the, most of this is occurring. Glycolysis, remember, takes place here in the cytoplasm in the liquidy portion of the cell. And now glycolysis generating pyruvate, pyruvate's going to enter into the mitochondria through these pores and enter into the matrix, which is this inner part on the inside of this inner membrane. It's a double membrane, so it's on the inner part of the inner membrane. Um, and so that's where the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle is taking place. Here's an overview of the process. We have pyruvate, which is three carbons. In this uh, first step, coenzyme A joins with the pyruvate it releases a carbon dioxide molecule, and it's going to generate some uh, acetyl-CoA. Enters the Krebs cycle. There's a whole lot of steps that happen that I'm not talking about. Another two carbon dioxides come off. We generate three ATPs. I'm sorry, three NADHs. Um, another ATP here, and that should be two, and then FADH2 as well. Here's a little more detail. You don't necessarily have to know all of these steps, but you see three carbons here. Each of these little blue circles represents a carbon atom. So we have three carbons um, joining together with acetyl... With, I'm sorry, um, carbon dioxide comes off. We have acetyl-CoA, which is two carbons. It's going to join and form another six-carbon molecule. And another carbon dioxide comes off, so now we have a five-carbon molecule. Another carbon dioxide comes off, now we have a four. It's going to get rearranged, generating some ATP. It's going to uh, get rearranged again, generating some FADH2, and um, it's going to make its way all the way back to, to the um, beginning of the cycle. So the carbons are coming off that started out with glucose, but um, the rest of these carbons 
get recycled back around and used over and over again. Now the next step in the process is the part that uses oxygen. It's called oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain that's part of it. This takes place on the Christi of the mitochondrion. This is the inner membrane. Um, this uses an electron transport chain using cytochrome molecules. The process is going to look a lot like the dark reaction of photosynthesis. Actually, not the dark reaction, the light reaction of photosynthesis. Electrons from NADH and FADH2 are going to be carried to oxygen, which is their final electron acceptor. Oxygen is what makes this process possible. Okay? If oxygen weren't there to accept the electrons, the whole chain would stop because the electrons have to go somewhere. They have to end up somewhere and leave for more electrons to be able to move through. So oxygen is your final electron acceptor, allowing the process to continue. For every NADH, we get 3 ATP. Every FADH2, we get 2 ATP um, out of the final step. As the electrons are transferred, protons build up in the outer compartment of the mitochondrion, just like they did in the thylakoid membrane of the chloroplast. The protons are going to flow back through ATP synthase, just like they did in photosynthesis, and it's going to generate as many as up to 32 ATP in the process, depending on the cell and the exact electron transport chain, because there's different um, proteins that are involved for different organisms. So um, as many as 32, though, generated in the process from every glucose molecule. So here's sort of a simplified version of that. We have, um, this is again the um, Christi membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane. We've got a, a number of different cytochromes that are embedded in the membrane here, and um, they're going to be passing these electrons along for every electron that's passed along. The hydrogen ions are passing through and building up on the inner membrane space. That's the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, so it's the space in here where they build up. And remember, they can only pass through here at ATP synthase. As they do, they're going to catalyze this reaction of ADP adding on a phosphate group to form ATP. Um, at the end of the process, it's oxygen again. That's going to be the one that will be the final electron acceptor, allowing it to happen. All right, this is just another diagram giving you an overview. We start out with six carbons in glucose. Um, in glycolysis, which happens in the cytoplasm, four are generated, two are used up. Also, two NADH are generated. Um, <clears throat> from there, we, we split this apart, glucose apart, into two pyruvates, which are each three carbons. In the process, of, and then the uh, pyruvates are going to enter the Krebs cycle. Before the Krebs cycle, they're going to give off a carbon, and after the and during the Krebs cycle, they're going to give off two more carbons. Then we have also the generation of some NADH and some FADH2 in the process. All of this feeding into the electron transport uh, phosphorylation or um, oxidative phosphorylation that I mentioned before. And um, with the addition of oxygen to this thing, we're going to possibly get as many as 32 ATP out of the electron transport chain with a net harvest of about 36 ATP. That would be kind of the maximum. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit about some alternate metabolic pathways. As you know, the food you eat is broken down to extract energy. Now, starch and disaccharides like sucrose and maltose that you ingest are broken down into glucose by your digestive system, and eventually they're split during glycolysis, and that becomes your, your first step in the process of cellular respiration. We also ingest proteins in our diet. When you ingest those, they're breaking, broken down into amino acids, and by your digestive system, and then most of those are going to be used to build new proteins. Any unused amino acids can be converted to pyruvate or acetyl coenzyme A with byproducts of ammonia and urea. So you can break down protein for energy. It's not the best way to get energy, but it is possible. And when you do that, you have these byproducts of ammonia and urea, which, which need to be removed from the body because they're toxic. Um, and then we also have fats. Fats are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids by your digestive system. The fatty acids are eventually broken down into two carbon fragments, which enter the citric acid cycle as acetyl coenzyme A. So they just join the process a little bit later on. So fats are also used as energy, can be used as energy. 
um, any unused fats, any unused fatty acids are actually stored up in your cells, and we call that body fat. So here's a look at that. We have our ordinary pathway that we've been talking about. Carbohydrates are digested into sugars, enter glycolysis, converted to uh, acetyl-CoA, and then the Krebs cycle, and then electron transport chain. If you ingest fats, they are broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. Glycerol can enter glycolysis. Fatty acids uh, enter as um, acetyl-CoA. Then we have proteins. Proteins are broken down into amino acids. Um, they can enter at a variety of places in a variety of forms, and they're byproducts, ammonia. All right, last thing. I want to talk a little bit about feedback control over cell respiration. So you have some control over your cell respiration that is taking place at the cellular level. There's control over the rate of cell respiration and also the timing of glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. For example, here's one example. This is an enzyme called phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase catalyzes the initial reactions of glycolysis. So it's in those first few steps of glycolysis. And it is actually inhibited by the presence of ATP and by citrate, which is part of the citric acid cycle. Um, so if ATP builds up, meaning the cell has plenty of energy, it's going to inhibit the, um, the enzyme phosphofructokinase, which stops glycolysis from happening, which is efficient for the cell, because if you have enough ATP, you don't need to be doing glycolysis. This process is all, or I'm sorry, phosphofructokinase is also activated by um, adenosine monophosphate, which is produced whenever ADP, adenosine diphosphate, builds up. So if ADP builds up because you're not forming it into ATP, we're building up ADP, it gets converted to AMP, adenosine monophosphate, by removing one of the phosphates, and um, it will actually, if that builds up, it will activate phosphofructokinase. So that's a way of controlling how much um, cellular respiration is occurring in the cell, and it's all based on the amount of ATP and AMP. So here's just a little diagram of that. We have glucose, which is converted to an intermediate, another intermediate, and then eventually fructose 1,6-biphosphate, which is one of the parts of glycolysis. Phosphofructokinase is the enzyme that does that. If you have ATP building up, it will block phosphofructokinase. So we will have glucose converting into these intermediates, but we will not get the rest of the steps, and we will not generate pyruvic acid, and that's a way of stopping the process and conserving energy if you don't need to get more ATP. That's it for cellular respiration. Bring your questions to class.